Okay, so welcome to the annual retirement seminar held by Benefits Department of Williamsburg James City County Schools. I'm Lori Ann Smith. I'm your benefits coordinator. Also on the presentation is John Andre, who will be taking questions um, via the chat. And periodically, I will stop and ask if there are any questions. So we have a lot of information to cover today. And so hopefully we'll get everything in and won't have to hold you too long. So first thing, see if I can get this to move for me. Of course not. Let's start again. Let's go back to share. Back here. And here we are. All right, here we go. Awesome. So our agenda for today, as a former teacher, I know we always have to have our, um, well, I was business teacher, so our competencies um, in place and know what we're going to cover. So here's what we're going to cover today. I'm going to first talk a little bit about the plans, the VRS plans that are in place. Um, and there are three. Sometimes I know when you're talking to your colleagues, you may not realize that you may be talking about two different plans when you're talking about the Virginia retirement system. Um, then we're going to talk about the payout options for retirement. We will cover the VRS health insurance credit, group life insurance information, um, information specific to WJCC as it relates to retirement, and the VRS retirement forms. So hopefully you were able to download and print the forms because I will go over them um, at toward the end of the presentation. The final thing that's not on the agenda that we will do, for those of you who want to stay on at the end, I will take you to the Virginia Retirement website and kind of peruse around that a little bit and show you where some information, where you can find some information. So that's if you want to stay on at the end, that will be um, conducted then. Okay. All right. So notification, when you make your decision that you're going to retire, you need to notify your supervisor or slash principal in writing. So just telling me, just working with me is not enough. You do need to make sure you notify them in writing and CC human resources. The information goes before the board for approval, just like you were approved to be hired, you're approved when you leave. Um, and so we need to make sure that you put that information in writing to your supervisor. You can send it um, via a letter attached to an email or an email, but it does need to be in writing. Just telling them verbally is not enough. We need it in writing. The Virginia retirement system, um, there are three plans for um, school employees. And to be a part of the system, um, you must be a permanent full-time employee contracted to work at least 30 hours a week. You don't have an option to whether or not you wanna participate in the VRS plan. You are required if you are contracted to work 30 hours a week and we make sure that you're enrolled. So as I mentioned, there are three plans. Um, plan one, uh, for those who were hired into a VRS covered position before July 1 of 2020. That does not mean that you started at WJCC in 2020, uh, before 2020, 2010, I apologize, before 2010. Um, it means that you were in a VRS covered position. It could have been at the State Department, it could have been at another, another school division, um, but you are a member, Plan 1, if you were hired before July 1, 20. 10 and you were already a member. Plan two are those people hired into a VRS covered position after July 1 of 2010. So if you were an in a member or you were working, but you were not yet vested or you were hired after July 1 of 2010, then you're plan two. You are a hybrid member in VRS if you were hired into a VRS covered position after January 1 of 2014. Um, so those are the three plans. I'm not going to go into the detail about the plans. If you want to learn more about your plan, um, when I go to the website later in this presentation, you'll see where you can learn more information about your specific plan. Uh, just a bit more information, however, um, oftentimes I'm asked, you know, what are the requirements for retirement? So VRS has set, set out the years of service requirement, as well as the age requirement. So you see two columns there, um, unreduced and reduced. So you can consider a unreduced retirement as you make full retirement. Um, you have, have full age and years of service for unreduced retirement. Reduced retirement, you may think of as early retirement, 
um, you're retiring earlier than your unreduced or your full age and years of service. So there are a couple of options. Of course, if you do the reduced, then your money is spread, stretched over a longer period of time. And so you get a little less each month. If you do your, your unreduced, then you're gonna get a little bit more. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you later about how that's calculated, not that you are expected to calculate it, but what, how that age and years of service factors in. So that information is there for plan one, which I suspect most of you are who are watching this presentation or on this um, Zoom with me today, our plan one, unreduced, you have to be at least 50 years old with 30 years of service or 65 years old with five years of service. Um, that gets you unreduced retirement. Reduced retirement or early retirement, if you are age 50 with 10 years of service or 55 with five years of service. And then you can see plan two members, um, you have to reach normal social security age. Now that is gonna change based on what year you were born. Um, and you can look that up or information is on the internet. Based on what year you were born is your normal social security age. And then you must have at least five years of service or the rule of 90. The rule of 90 simply states that you have to have years of service plus age that equal 90. So for example, 60 years of age plus 30 years of service equals 90. So, so normal social security age, five years of service or rule of 90 in order uh, to have unreduced retirement under both actually plan two and hybrid or for reduced age 60 with at least five years of service. If you notice under the hybrid, I have a DB in parentheses there. That is for defined benefit portion. So those are the age requirements for retirement for your defined benefit portion of your retirement plan. Again, to get additional details on your specific plan, you should visit the website. And the website is listed there, varetire.org. Um, I'm going to encourage you to go to the My VRS portal. If you have not already registered for My VRS, I'm going to show you at the end again when I go to the website how to do that. Um, you can do go there and do estimates for what your retirement benefit would look like when you get ready to retire. Um, you could decide. You could do um, planning. They have retirement planning portal information there, uh, as well as lots of other information regarding group life insurance. What does your group life insurance policy look like? What is the value of that? But lots of good information in your My VRS portal. If you have not accessed that or you've not registered, I encourage you to do so. All right, so we're going to move right into talking about the various plan, um, retirement plan payout options. And there are four basic benefit, survivor option, advanced pension option, and of course the PLUP. A lot of people hear about this PLUP. What does it stand for? Partial lump sum option payment. It is a plop, and you do have to be eligible for the plop. Everybody's not eligible. Just a little bit of other information to share with you. Once you have made a, a selection on your payout option in retirement, you fill out the forms, you've made a selection. Generally, you cannot change that. That is irrevocable, except there's always an except. There's one exception, and I'll share with that with you later. There is a place on the retirement form for your spouse to sign. If you are married, your spouse must sign. That is a VRS rule, not a WJCC rule. Okay, your spouse must sign. If you are separated but not divorced, your spouse is still expected to sign. If you cannot get that spouse to sign, then you have to put that information in writing um, to VRS. You need to contact them, let them know, and they'll tell you exactly what you need to do and say in your, um, in your letter. But the spousal acknowledgement must be signed. And we will, I'll show you where that is when we go over the form. So we're gonna start with the basic benefit payout option. Um, ba the basic benefit payout option is the most money in your monthly benefit on a consistent basis. Um, the basic benefit option does stop at the time of the retiree's death. So when the retiree passes away, no one is going to continue to get a monthly benefit after that. That's the survivor option, which I'm going to talk about next. When you retire, your money comes, your monthly benefit comes from your member contribution account first. So you've been contributing to VRS um, out of your paycheck all of these years. It's going into a member contribution account. 
So your monthly benefit will come out of that first until it's depleted. Once it's depleted, you still have a lifetime benefit. Those monies, however, come from the VRS trust. That's where WJCC's contribution has been going on your behalf. So you do have a lifetime benefit. However, the monies for your monthly be uh, retirement benefit will come out of your member contribution account first. Now, how is that monthly benefit calculated? There is a formula. It's the average final compensation times your years of service times a multiplier. And of course you have to met, reach a certain age in order to they'll determine whether you are at the reduced or unreduced level. So the average final compensation, what is that? For plan one um, members, it is your highest consecutive months of compensation. So most people say, oh, it's my last 36 months. Well, possibly if that's your highest um, 36 months of compensation. For others, it may be somewhere else in their career. We have had teachers who have gone from being teachers to being um, teacher assistants. And so their salary was a little less. BRS, BRS's formula will go into their system and find your highest 36 months of compensation and do that calculation. So if you're going into my VRS, as I mentioned earlier, they take care of all that for you in the background. For plan two and hybrid members, your average final compensation is based on your highest consecutive 60 months of compensation. So it's stretched out a little farther than the plan one, 60 months. So VRS again, will do that calculation in my VRS for you. You don't have to sit down with a paper and pen and do that, okay? So I'm gonna provide an example. Again, if those of you who've been with me before, you've probably seen this example. I'm gonna do basing it on plan one and a basic benefit payout, you doing unreduced and reduced, and most things being equal except for the age, you'll see the difference. So we have Bill, who is planning to retire. Bill is 65 years old. He has 25 years of service. His salary, his highest compensation over the three years, 45,000, 50,000, and 52,000. Using the formula, the AFC, times the multiplier of 1.76%. The multiplier is set by the General Assembly. That's not set by VRS, it's not set by WJCC. That's a multiplier that's set and it's in law by the General Assembly. So that factors in for plan one. Plan two is 1.65% and for hybrid it's 1%. But again, we're doing plan one example. So the AFC times the 1.7% multiplier times your years of service divided by 12 gives you the monthly benefit. To calculate Bill's um, average final compensation, we took his three highest years of consecutive um, compensation, divided it by three, we got 49,000. Then we plugged everything into the formula and his estimated monthly gross benefit, retirement benefit will be about $1,700 as you see there. And the amount that you would do on your estimates are gross, they're not, they are not, don't take into consideration your taxes because they have to get that information in VRS to see how many people your exemptions are, if you want them to take out taxes or not, and some people don't. So the estimates that you get online are based on the gross, okay? Now let's look at an employee who's gonna have reduced retirement. This is Barb and she is retiring. She is 55 years of age and she has also has 25 years of service. Her salary compensation was exactly the same as Bill's. If you look at the formula, however, you see I had to add in an early retirement factor. Remember reduced people who are on the reduced, they're gonna get a little bit less over a longer period of time is the expectation. So they have to factor in that early multiplier, our early retirement factor. And again, VRS does that for you automatically. In my VRS, the AFC was exactly the same. And we get to this point of the 173542, just like Bill. However, that multiplier, factored in brings her monthly benefit to 16, just over $1,600. So it's a little bit less. Um, she's retiring a little early because remember she's on the reduced side. She's 55 with 25 years of service. She does not ha yet have 30 years of service and she has not yet reached the age of 65, okay? Before I go any farther, um, just wanna make sure, uh, John, are there any questions? in the chat about the example I just did or anything I've said so far. 
I do have two questions, Laurie. The first one going back to one of the first slides is requiring the principal or supervisor. The question is how soon before your to notify them with your intent to retire. Okay, so I could not hear you. I don't know if you might need to be closer to your mic. I couldn't hear you. How, how much notice do you have to give before you intend to retire is basically because it was my question. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, the amount of note, you need to give the notice as soon as you can. Um, lots of reasons behind that. We, we're gonna need to be able to fill your position and recruit. As soon as you know, and this is your definite response um, that you want to retire, definitely let us know. Now, as I get later in the presentation, I will tell you VRS requires or wants your paperwork into them at least 60 days prior to your retirement date. So you're going to give us at least 60 days notice, okay? Um, because so if your retirement date is July 1, then um, you Paperwork needs to be at VRS by May 1, which means you probably need to have it to me shortly after spring break, unless of course you want to send it in yourself, which you can do, and I'll share that with you later too. Thank you. And there's one other question, John, that we had. If you can hear me now, still can I'm still here, but I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I apologize. I can, I can tell you what my question is. Okay. I, I had asked, how do you request that they withhold taxes from your retirement payment? So when we get to the forms, you will see on the form a place for tax withholding. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move on and talk about our next um, payout option, which is the survivor option. Um, the survivor option provides a monthly benefit or survivor. Oh, there's one more question. Okay. All right. So um, there's one more question out there. So I understand. So just come on and ask me your question. So there was one more question. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move on then. So the survivor option provides monthly benefits. Yes. It probably was mine and I think you're gonna answer it later. It, it uh, what, one of the things that's hard to tell is, sorry, is whether or not, um, when you're looking at the money that the VRS tells you you're gonna get, mm -hmm. you know that in your check, you've got all these things you put aside, IRAs and United Way and all that. So it's hard to tell what the real number will be when you retire, when you're only looking at the paycheck the way they show it on VRS. So that's that's probably something you're gonna cover. Well, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and address that now. So with VRS, remember this is VRS and not WJCC. So with WJCC, you have all these other deductions coming out, like for instance, your 403B, um, your health insurance, and maybe um, your WVEA. And so the only thing that VRS is not going to make those deductions out of your monthly the only thing that's going to come out is your, your taxes. As a matter of fact, state employees can have their health insurance, for example, deducted. We do not do that as school employees. So your deductions from your um, monthly benefit, your monthly retirement benefit will be your taxes that you would normally pay your FICA, um, federal and state. Okay. Um, hopefully that, that covers that. So um, going back to the survivor option, Please provide monthly benefit to us. Uh, it will provide a monthly benefit to a survivor after the retiree's death. So if you want your spouse or your child to receive a monthly benefit after you pass away, then you would need to choose the survivor option as your payout option. However, keep in mind, you um, that will reduce your monthly benefit from that, that basic benefit amount. Um, and the monthly benefit is gonna be based um, on the amount that you say you want that person to receive because there's a percentage between 10 and 100%, which I'm gonna talk about a little later too in just a few minutes. Um, and only a spouse can receive 100%. It also factors in the age difference between you and that person. So if you want your, if your survivor is your child, there's a great age difference and that's gonna significantly or potentially significantly reduce your monthly benefit because they're also looking at the life expectancy of that child when they're looking at that survivor information. Who can receive a, a, a survivor benefit? Anyone selected um, that you select. So um, it could be a relative, it could be a friend, 
Um, if you, you really like me a lot, I'll give you my name and social security number. No, I'm kidding. And I'll be your survivor. <laughs> um, but it, anybody you select can be your survivor. You just want to keep in mind those things that I mentioned, the age difference and um, the percentage that you're going to need to decide. So the calculation for the survivor, again, is based on the age difference between you and the survivor, the percent that you assign, and only a, um, a spouse can take up to 100% of your, or be, have up to 100% of your monthly benefit that's based on IRS limits. Um, and what happens if my survivor dies? So remember I said earlier that once you make your selection on your payout option, that you could not change it. Well, this is the one exception to that rule. And that's if your survivor passes before you do. If your survivor passes away, then you can choose another survivor or you can go back and choose the basic benefit option. If you divorce the person that you listed as a survivor, there are a few more criteria than just having to be divorced. That is factors in how long were you married to the person and some other information. So you wanna make sure um, if you divorce that uh, whether or not you can actually change that survivor option. And then the third thing is if the survivor actually gives up the benefit. So let's say you decide that your survivor is your child and your child says, mom, dad, I don't know why you did that, um, but I, you, sh you shouldn't have done that. You should have taken the basic benefit option so you could get more in your check each month. It's not that simple. They um, have to provide a letter from a doctor saying that they are of sound mind uh, in making that decision. And then they have to put it in writing that they do not want um, this the survivor uh, option or the survivor benefits. And then of course you go back to being um, basic benefit or choose another survivor. So that's, that's how that works. The third option for payout is the advanced pension option. And this is the one that's a mostly confusing for people to people. So I'm gonna do my very best to explain it. So you must be eligible for the advanced pension option. Um, you must be at the unreduced retirement level. Remember, I mentioned early unreduced versus reduced. So you must be at the unreduced retirement level or at least 55 years of age if you're plan one, at least 60 years of age if you're plan two at one hybrid, and you must be vested. So vested means you've been in the, um, you've been a member for at least five years. And so everybody on this call is likely vested. But in order to be eligible for the advanced pension option and to select the advanced pension option, you must meet the eligibility criteria. Now, what does it do? It temporarily increases your monthly benefit from VRS until at age which you choose, which is between 62 and your eligible social security age, when you're eligible for full social security. So on, actually on the, the form, when we go to the form, if you choose this option, you would have to tell VRS at what age you want them to reduce your VRS benefit. Does this affect your social security benefit? No, but they will need an estimate of what your social security benefit would look like when you are eligible to, to draw full social security. And you can do that online. Um, I'm not as familiar with how to do that, but I can certainly try to help to look at, look at it with you but it is all online and there's a process you must go through. And you have to print that, uh, that um, estimate from social security and send that in with your paperwork. So if you choose this advanced pension option, that's what happens. Uh, again, you must provide the documentation from social security. So with, this, with the advanced pension option, you cannot do survivor option and you cannot do PLOP if you're eligible for the PLOP. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. But with the advanced pension option, you cannot do a survivor and you cannot do plot. And remember that these um, payout options are irrevocable. And I wanna drop this in there. They're irrevocable even if you decide to stop retirement, come back to work for a while, work full-time somewhere, whether it's WJCC or another VRS um, employer, and then you retire again, you have to take the same payout option that you chose when you first retired. So just keep that in mind. So here's my little graphic because I'm a visual learner. So on the left side, you see the VRS benefit and then a red temporary increase. So what VRS does is they take that information from your social security estimate that you provided and they do an increase of your monthly benefit for a short, for a period of time until the age which you tell them to do, to, to drop it, which is between 62 and your full social security uh, eligible age. Then when it drops on the right side, you see VRS benefit, social security benefit. 
the purpose of that or the idea behind that is that your monthly income will be the same, that it will be about the same. So while BRS is going to increase for a little while, it's going to drop. So security is going to kick in with the idea that your overall monthly income, now that you have two checks coming in, will be about the same. So that's the, the idea behind advanced pension option. If you're considering that option or any of these options, I do encourage you to, um, talk, to talk to a financial advisor and, um, and on, on any of this actually and um, decide some things that you might wanna do, especially when it comes to this one, the PLUP. So the PLUP, you, to, to be eligible for the PLUP, you must re reach unreduced eligibility meaning you can't do it if you're at the reduced level, you don't have the age and the years to be unreduced. You have to be at the unreduced eligibility level. And you must work one, two, or three years beyond that eligibility, unreduced eligibility, okay? So let's say that you are 50 years old, you have 30 years of service and you wanna plop. Well, you can't because you just made the um, unreduced eligibility and you have not worked at least 12 months beyond your unreduced eligibility. But let's say you're 50 years old and you have 32 years of service then you could plot to, you could do a plot and you could choose to do one or two years plot, okay? What that simply means is they take that basic benefit that I showed you earlier. Remember for Bill, it was like $1,700. They take that and they multiply it times 12 for one year, 24 for two years and um, 36 for three years. And that would be your amount, the lump sum amount that they would give you. Um, in addition to receiving that lump sum amount, by the way, you do still get your monthly benefit, but it reduces your monthly benefit. So you're gonna get a, a chunk of money up front. You're still gonna get a monthly benefit for the rest of your life, but it's just gonna reduce what that's gonna look like for the rest of your life, okay? That's because you're getting a chunk up front. The, the PLOP is a one-time payment. It's issued after your first monthly um, benefit has been deposited into your account. Or you have the option to roll over the PLOP. And a lot of people do this. If you have an IRA, a 403B, a 457, or other qualifying account that will receive these pre-tax dollars, then you can roll it over, but you have to say what you wanna do with the PLOP on the application that we're gonna talk about later. So that's an option. You can have the money come directly to you or you can have it rolled over. Now, if the money comes directly to you, there are some tax implications. Um, the distribution is 20% federal, 4% state. And if you are less than 59 and a half, there is possibility of a 10% um, penalty from the IRS when you file your taxes. So keep in mind the uh, information about the plot. So it will reduce your monthly benefit. You have to be eligible. You have to work at least 12 months beyond, beyond your unreduced eligibility. And it's a one-time lump sum of money that you receive, but you do still receive a monthly benefit, albeit a reduced amount. By the way, the lady and gentleman at the top of the screen are not fighting, they're dancing. Just want you to know. <laughs> okay, before we move on, Don, hopefully I'll be able to hear you. Are there any questions in the chat? Let's give it a try. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, we, I don't see any new ones, um, any new questions added. So Okay. Awesome. We'll keep rolling on. Okay. The VRS health insurance credit, you probably have heard of this. There is a VRS 45 form. That's one of the forms I um, sent a link to in the email that you received. And if you did not um, receive the email and you're watching this later on, when I go to um, the VRS website, I'll show you where to find the forms online. They're all online, they're all fillable forms. You do still have to print them, sign them and, and either bring them to me or send them into VRS, okay? So for the VRS health insurance credit, in order to be eligible, you have to have been a member for at least 15 years. So you have to have been a member of VRS for at least 15 years. Sometimes I'll have people that will tell me that, you know, I've been working for the school division for 20 years. Um, and that's great. But five of those years, or maybe six of those years, you were part-time. And so you weren't eligible for VRS. And so it's, you have to have actually been a member of VRS for 15 years. The VRS health insurance um, credit is a tax-free credit that's added to your monthly 
benefit. So it's added to your monthly, it's not taxed. So basically they figure out your gross, they take out your FICA state and federal, and then they add back in your health insurance credit. So it's not taxed money. And you get it um, as a retiree, you receive the health insurance credit added to your monthly benefit for the rest of your life, okay? Um, it applies, as I said, to your retirement benefit. The health insurance credit, health insurance credit ends upon the retiree's death. So if, even if you chose a survivor option and you wanted someone after you to, after your passing to receive a monthly benefit, they don't get the health insurance credit. It's for the retiree only. Okay. The calculation for that credit is $4 times the years of service for professional employees. That would include our teachers, administrators, uh, PAs, office staff, um, uh, central office staff. And it's $1.50 for our non-professional staff. That includes our custodial staff, um, our operations staff, transportation. That will be under the non-professional. However, a bill did pass in the General Assembly that non-professional staff would be increased to $4. That does not go into effect until Ju uh, July 1, 2021. So if you retire right now and you are non-professional under the non-professional code, you would get the $1.50 with a maximum of $45 a year. Um, and that, that's what you would get until the, the new uh, law, goes, go, law goes into effect. So the for my professional people who are on, $4 times a year is a service. So for example, if you have worked 30 years and you retire, that's $120 they would add to your check each month. If you are paying $80 for your, cert, for your insurance a month, they're only gonna give you $80. So that calculation is the ceiling amount that they will give you, okay? Not the minimum, but the maximum that they would give you added to your check each month. Um, so, but if you pay, if, if you're, um, the calculation is $120 um, and you pay $150, you're still only gonna get the $120, okay? Just wanted to make sure that you did that. Okay, I keep seeing something pop up on my screen. I wanna make sure everything is okay. All right, group life insurance. So WJCC pays for life insurance on behalf of everyone who is a member of VRS. The life insurance is based on your salary. I have an example there. It's your salary rounded up to the nearest thousand and then doubled. In my example, you have $49,780 is someone's salary. Rounded up to the nearest thousand is $50,000. Doubled the value of their life insurance is $100,000. Once you retire, then your benefit will begin to reduce. That, that group life insurance value will begin to reduce after you've been retired one full calendar year. So and it will reduce 25% each January until it's 25% of the original value. So again, back to my example, you retire July 1, 2021. The first reduction will not take place until January of 2023. Then it will reduce. And then again in 2024 and in 2025 until it's 25% of its original value and then it stops reducing. So it does not completely go away, but it does stop reducing. If you have purchased or you are purchasing optional life insurance, that's, a, that's an addition to the group life insurance that WJCC is paid for, the basic life insurance that WJCC is paid for on your behalf. But you're buying, you're buying optional life insurance and you're covering yourself or a spouse and or children. You have, I believe it's like 30 days after you retire, to um, talk to Minnesota Life to convert that policy. You do have to have had that policy for at least 60 months in order to be able to do that. And if you look at the benefits matrix information that I sent um, to you, that information is on there and you would contact Minnesota Life directly, tell them that you have optional life and you'd like to purchase um, some additional, uh, to do like to roll it over. And you could roll it over to a whole life policy because our policies that we pay for our term life policies. You could go a little bit to our whole life policy. You could keep it a term life policy, but Minnesota Life will tell you that, okay? All right, moving on. 
the application process. So again, I'm going to go over the application specifically at the end of the presentation. However, as I mentioned earlier, when you plan to retire, VRS likes to have the paperwork 60 days before the intended retirement date. Now, have I had um, people give me the information or give uh, talk to me and it's like 30 days out or two weeks out or it was last month that they wanted to retire effective? Yes, I have and it will be processed. The thought behind the 60 days is VRS wants to have time to process everything, get everything in, get taken care of so that you can get your first benefit check on time. However, if it doesn't come when it's intended to come, then you will get the full amount that you're due in your first benefit check. When is my first benefit check due? So if you retire effective July 1 of the year, your first benefit check would be in August, the 1st of August. So my 10 month employees, if you retire effective July 1, you will get your July and August paycheck from WJCC, and you will get your uh, first retirement check from VRS the 1st of August. Okay, and I'm saying that the WJCC part is if you have fulfilled your contract through June. So then you do get your July and August paycheck. Then August, that basically you get two checks. You have one at the beginning of the month from VRS and one at the end of the month to close out your contract with WJCC. Um, the forms are the VRS 5 and the 45. Um, again, I sent those as a link to you all and we will go over it. If you want to look at the forms online or if you want to fill them out online because they are fillable, you go to the website, varetired.org, click on forms. I always go to all forms because I want to see everything. Um, and then you look for the five and the 45. One more thing and then I'm gonna uh, see if there are any questions out there. Um, so the documents that are required for what, that last slide disappeared right as I went. Is it five and 45? Okay. Let me back up. See if I can back up. Yes, okay. VRS 5 and VRS 45. All right, got it. Got it? Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, application for service retirement, again, for the VRS 5, health insurance credit, the VRS 45. If you're eligible, remember you have to have been with with VRS for 15 years for the health insurance credit. And if you're doing the advanced pension option as a payout option, you also need to do that social security estimate online and send that as a part of your packet. Before we move on, John, do we have any questions? We have a few questions. So uh, I was almost ready to break in before we got too far away from the health insurance credit. First, um, an overhead question. Uh, can we get a copy of this presentation after this session? Absolutely. Just send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Now, getting into the health insurance credit, we have a few. Is the health insurance credit already included in the amount calculated in the online VRS benefit estimate calculator? No, it is not. Okay. Is the health insurance credit available for teacher assistants, clericals, and others? Yes. Do you have the option to cash life insurance out? I don't know. I don't think so. Because no, no, the answer to that is no, because it is a term policy, not a whole life policy. Okay. Uh, does the health insurance credit only pertain to the school's health insurance plans? Good question. No, it does not. It's the school's health insurance plan, any other health insurance plan that you might have, um, and also includes Medicare coverage, for Medicare coverage. So if you're on a spouse's plan, if you're on TRICARE, um, if you have a plan through um, the uh, marketplace, all of those, as long as it's health insurance, it covers. It does not cover for like life insurance and things like that. But if it's health insurance, yes. But if it's um, other insurances like life insurance or um, long-term care or something like that, no. Okay. Uh, one more generic question. I hope there'll be one more after this. Can we work as a part-time teacher for WJCC after retiring as full-time? So there is a requirement that you have to have a bona fide break in service of one month. For teachers, um, or 10 month employees, not just teachers, for 10 month employees, your bona fide break one month service is the month of September because summer does not count. That's if you retire effective July 1. Um, we cannot by uh, law and by VRS regulations uh, make any commitment to part-time or any other type of work prior to your retirement. As a matter of fact, I have to certify that I have not talked to anyone about 
um, retirement uh, work after retirement. We do have one more um, on the health insurance benefit. Can it go to Medicare or to help pay for Medicare? So the health insurance benefit does not go to anywhere except to you. Um, it comes is added to your monthly benefit each month, and then is your responsibility to pay the cost of your insurance. So it does not go; it is not paid out to Anthem, to Medicare, or to so anywhere else. It comes is added to your monthly benefit each month. It goes into your bank account, and then it's your responsibility to pay that directly. Mm -hmm. One last question for this section. Where can we check to ensure we have assigned beneficiary, beneficiaries to our life insurance? So um, you can call VRS. They will not tell you who your beneficiaries are. And I will tell you why. Because people they get calls all the time to be with other people pretending to be the participant to find out if they're somebody's beneficiary. But you can call them and, and you can say, um, I just want to check my beneficiaries. I think I have Lorianne Smith listed as my primary. Is that correct? And they will say yes or no. And they will only answer that question a couple times. Their response to you is going to be, when in doubt, fill it out. If you're not sure that you've listed someone or that you sure that you didn't change someone and you want to change people out, fill out a new form. The forms are online. The beneficiary forms are online and I'll show you where that is or I can send you the link to it. But I'm helping you to be self-sufficient here a little bit. You can find it online, the beneficiary form and print it, fill it out and then actually send it in yourself. I always do encourage people to keep copies of their beneficiary forms. We do not keep copies here as advised by VRS. And that's it for right now. Okay, awesome. So I just wanna cover this slide really quick. Members will receive a packet. Once you uh, send in your, your paperwork about two weeks prior to your retirement date, um, you will receive a packet from VRS and it will include um, your retirement certificate that tells you your, benef your actual benefit amount, your life insurance benefit amount, your first cost of living adjustment, and you will get cost of living adjustment depending on how you know stocks are doing, how the economy is doing, and so on and so forth. Your first cost of living adjustment will likely occur um, 18 months after your retirement, and it's usually issued on ju in July of uh, uh, each year. So in, in your um, retirement certificate information, you want, you'll get that information. You will also receive a retiree handbook. I want you, at the bottom of the screen, you see a note there. You will not receive a monthly statement from VRS telling you that your money went into your account. They will send you one statement in, the, in that re um, retirement certificate that says how much your monthly um, amount is, and they will not send you another one unless there's a change. For example, you change your exemptions. Uh, and your, your tax withholdings, I mean. And so that changes your, your net amount or something like that. Other than that, or if there's a cost of living adjustment and your net amount has changed, then they will update you, but they will not send a monthly statement to you. You will receive a 1099-R from them for taxes. So be on the lookout for that. Just like you get a W-2 from, from WJCC, when you retire, you get a 1099-R from VRS. Um, John, were you about to ask me another question? Yeah, I think before we leave this topic, there are a couple. Uh, one request to please send the beneficiary link. Um, just send me an email or I can always show you at the end of the presentation. Okay, staying with beneficiaries. Can we name more than one beneficiary or contingent beneficiaries? Absolutely. On the form, there's a place where you would check for primary or contingent and also tell a percentage that you want that person to receive. The form actually allows for about three people. Um, however, they have a continuation form where you could list um, more people and you just check at the bottom that you have a continuation form. I had one, one retiree, she had the original retirement beneficiary form and three contingency forms. She had that many people she wanted to distribute her, her um, retirement benefit or her life insurance to. So there's, so you can list as many people as you need to. You just need to make sure if it's more than three that you also download that continuation form. So I believe the VRS beneficiary form is the VRS two and the continuation form is a three. And we will look at that specifically when we go to the, to the site. Okay. Why don't we do one more so you don't lose your momentum completely. Okay. Uh, do we need to send receipts for use of health insurance credit? No, you do not have to provide VRS receipts, but you will fill out that form indicating to them 
what your cost is for your health insurance. And when we get to the form, we'll go all over go over all of that. That's how they know whether to give you the full amount that you're due or less, depending on how much you pay. So mm. not, it's not like an FSA where you have to provide receipts to them. No. Okay. We ready to move on? All right. Some WJCC specific information. So for our retirees, um, we do pay out for sick leave and that's for retirees only. If you resign from the school division, sick leave is not paid out. However you retire, it is paid out. That's why it's also important for you to, to write that letter and be sure you say in the letter that you plan to retire effective and the date. So if it's the effective at the end of the school year, if it's effective, if you wanna say July 1 or May 1 or whatever date it is, by the way, Virginia retirement is always as of the first of the month, not the 15th of the month, not the 30th of the month, the first of the month. So if you're retiring, you just keep that in mind, the retirement date is as of the first of the month. So the sick leave payout, you will receive a retiree, 25% of your daily rate or $25, whichever is higher, times the number of days you have remaining with a maximum of $5,000. That's the maximum amount that you can receive and that's based on school board policy. So 25% of your daily rate, or $25, whichever is higher. I've had people ask me, what is, how do I know my daily rate? You take your contract amount, divide it by the number of days you're contracted to work, that's your daily rate. And then you multiply times 25% to get the 25%. If you are a July 1 retiree, you will receive your payout, your sick leave payout in your July check. What has, what has to happen is the payroll has to capture any leave days that you may have taken in June. So if you are a, um, March 1 retiree, then you will get that payout in, in March because you're gonna you may have had some sick days in the month leading up to months leading up to we want to make sure we capture all of that. Again, there's a maximum of five thousand dollars. You have the option if you choose to do this and, and you have a 403B with Mass Mutual that you have a payroll deduction going from your payroll check at WJCC, you have the option of having your sick leave payout rolled into your 403B. Let me say that again. If you have a 403B with Mass Mutual through WJCC, which you have a payroll deduction going into, you can have your sick leave payout rolled into that. We just need to know that ahead of time so that Lacey can set that up, okay? But please, please let us know ahead of time. Don't decide it, you know, it's June 15th and you decide, oh, I wanted my payout to go in there. It's, it's kind of gonna to be too late at that point. Okay, so just let, let us know ahead of time. For those of you who may be 12 months employees and you're retiring, WJCC will pay you out for up to 35 days of your unused annual leave. The maximum is 35 days and that's at your full daily rate, the maximum of 35 days, okay? Flexible spending accounts. If you have a flexible spending account, the medical um, or healthcare account, you may submit receipts and or use your card up through um, your termination date, okay? Um, and if you're gonna be submitting receipts, you wanna go ahead and do that. You can use the full amount that you have allocated, okay? And it's gonna come out, if, you, if you're a 10 month employee, the remaining amount is gonna come out of your July and August check anyway but you, want, you can go ahead and use the full annual amount that you have um, allotted for. If you retire in March, you can still use the full allotted amount that you allotted for on the medical, okay? The dependent care is a little different. If you have the dependent care, um, you can be reimbursed for any costs or any expenses that you incur throughout the entire plan year, including through the 90 day grace period. Our 90 day grace period goes through, you know, our plan year ends for the FSAs um, September 30th. So that means you have until about mid December or so to get those receipts mm -hmm. in if you have a defined care, excuse me, the dependent care account. Okay. Again, the 403B, if you have a 403B or 457. Uh, through Mass Mutual. By the way, Mass Mutual is now Empower. They have they Empower. The name the name of the company is Empower, and they have bought out the retirement portion of Mass Mutual's business. 
Um, so if you get anything in the mail and you've had a 403B or 457 through Empower, or through Mass Mutual, and it says Empower, it's legit. They have bought out Mass Mutual. Um, earlier, I mentioned that you could roll your sick leave payout into your 403B, but if you have a 457, you could roll it in there as well, okay? So your options, if you have a 403B or 457 through Mass Mutual, you can keep the funds uh, invested, leave them there, let them sit there and continue to grow. You can roll them over into another um, account that you have more maybe investing power over. Maybe it's an IRA or it's with Edward Jones or somewhere else, you can roll that over or you can withdraw the funds. Now, in either case, if you're gonna be rolling over or withdrawing the funds, you need to get the form from Mass Mutual slash Empower. They will tell you how to fill it out and then you bring it here to me or email it to me or fax it to me and I will sign off on it and fax it in for you. Um, I don't know if you can see the number there, it's 800-528-9009. That's the number for Mass Mutual. That's their customer care number. You would call them directly. It is also on the matrix that I um, had you sent, that I had sent to you and you could print. Um, call them directly and they will provide, I hear somebody's mic is on. Um, they will provide you the first, okay? All right. Medical insurance. This is what most people really want to hear about, okay? The medical insurance. So as a retiree, you can stay on WJCC's. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to check their mics, please. Um, make sure your mic is, is off. Thank you. Um, as a retiree, you can stay on WJCC's health insurance if you meet the criteria. So the, the, the policy states an employee who ends their full-time employment, receive benefits from VRS, shall be eligible for continuation of health insurance on uh, medical and dental at the retiree's expense. So that means you're going to be paying the full cost of the coverage, the, the total premium, um, until you become eligible for Medicare. So eligible for Medicare means the first of the month during which you turn 65. So if you turn 65 on June 19th, then you're eligible for Medicare on June 1, and you are a retiree who stay on WJCC's coverage, your WJCC coverage will end on May 31st. Okay, so you have to have met this following criteria in order to stay on the coverage. You have to have been with the Williamsburg James City County Schools for a minimum of five years of service. And you must have been a on our health plan for at least 24 months leading up to your retirement date. Okay, it can't be 24 months, five years ago. It has to be, so you have to be, have been on the plan 24 months leading up to your retirement. And you may continue the coverage. You may keep the same coverage that you have, or you may decrease coverage. You cannot increase coverage. So our highest, most expensive coverage that we have is the Key Advantage 250. If you decide that you want to lower, lower a less expensive coverage in retirement, you can drop down to the Key Advantage 500. However, you cannot do the reverse. If you have Key Advantage 500 at retirement, you cannot then boot up to the Key, the key Advantage 500. Excuse me, Key Advantage 250, I apologize. That's the higher one, okay? You cannot add people at retirement if that, are, that aren't already on your coverage at retirement. The WJCC will also give you a contribution toward the cost of your health insurance. I kind of refer to it as the WJCC health insurance credit. The amount is $750. Um, which breaks down to $62.50 a month. So you would receive a check directly to you. It's not paid to Medicare, it's not, excuse me, not paid to, to Anthem, it's not paid to TLC, it's not paid to anywhere else, but directly to you. And then it's up to you again to pay it. So it's, it, it amounts to $62.50, $750 a year. However, there are criteria. You must have been with the division for 12 continuous years. Okay, so you have to have been with WJCC for 12 continuous years to get the 750. So you could technically stay on the coverage, but not be eligible for the, for the 750 from WJCC. This has nothing to do with the VRS health insurance credit. Okay, just please keep in mind, these are two separate things. VRS health insurance credit, you have to have been with VRS for 15 years. The WJCC 750, $62.50 a month. 
you have to have been with WJCC for 12 continuous years of service based on school board policy, okay? John, before I go on, are there any questions? We do have a few questions. Um, what is the COLA formula and how is that determined? So the cost of living adjustment formula is um, actually in the retiree handbook. And I'm not gonna tell you what it is because I don't want to give you misguided information. Um, for everybody who's participated um, today and who is on the list to participate, I'm going to send via in office mail this retiree getting ready to retire handbook. And that information is in here. It is also online on the VRS website. Um, I know it's based on the, um, the urban index and that's as much as I know. <laughs> and so um, it is determined by VRS every year and then how much that's gonna be and if it's actually gonna be distributed. Uh, this one you addressed after it was asked, but just in case, how is the daily rate calculated? The daily rate for um, the payout, the sick leave payout? Yes. Okay, so it's your um, salary, your annual salary that's listed on your contract divided by um, your number of days you're contracted to work. So if your salary is $50,000, you're a 10 month teacher and you're contracted to work 210 days, you would take that 50,000 divided by 10 and you would get your monthly, I mean, your, your daily rate is 25% of that. Are there different tax treatments for sick leave paid out to employee versus a rollover? So if the sick leave is paid out to you, it's going to be taxed just like any other income or that you would receive from WJCC. If you roll it over to your VRS, it will be taxed at the time that you would, I'm sorry, not, uh, let me back that up. If it's rolled over to your Mass Mutual 403B or 457, I didn't mention 457 earlier, then it will be taxed at the time that you withdraw it based on the rate of taxation at that time. Okay. I uh, believe you covered this one after the fact, but again, to make sure, what is my retirement date if I work till the end of my contract, June 18th, and I am 65 years old, and what is the date that my health insurance ends? You're 65 years old, you work to the end of your contract, um, your uh, retirement date is July 1, and that's for anybody who works to the end of their 10-month contract, um, or 11-month contract, or 12-month contract, is July 1. Um, if you are 65 years old at the time of retirement, your health insurance will end on June 30th. If you are less than 65 years old at the time of retirement, your health insurance will go through September 30th, okay. unless you turn 65 between June and September. I believe this refers to the sick leave payout. For payout into the 403B, is that figured at the same calculation, 25% or $25 a day? Correct, yes. So that sick leave payout is gonna be the sick leave payout at the rate stated um, up to $5,000. Okay. For the FSA, do we have to use all the funds and submit our receipts by our retirement date? For the medical, you could probably go ahead and, and use it through September 30th. Um, usually I don't cut people off until September 30th, um, but for the, um, the dependent care, you would have until that additional 90 days we through, have through December. Um, so that you can, if you have a card and you have the medical, you know, the little debit card, you have the medical, you still would be able to use it because we're gonna recapture those funds in your July and August check. Can the WJCC health credit come through direct deposit? Uh, no, because it's not a payroll. It's, it going comes through accounts payable. Okay. Um, can the WJCC health insurance benefit of 750 go towards other health insurance or only towards the policy we have or had with WJCC? It would only go through WJCC if you have WJCC um, health insurance. So as a retiree, if you stay on the coverage, then you are eligible for that $750, uh, $62.50 a month. If you get off of our coverage and go into a spouse's coverage, for example, then you do not get that $750. Okay. Uh, two more, WJCC health insurance credit of $750 a year. Is this just before you are eligible for Medicare? 
Yes. So once you are eligible for Medicare, you're coming off of WJCC coverage and that $62.50 per month, $7.50 per year ends. And when would the unused sick leave payout occur? That occurs if you're a July 1 retiree, you would get that in the July paycheck. If you are, uh, I use the example of March 1, then you would get it in your March paycheck. We have to capture any days you would have taken leading up to your retirement date. Thank you, that's it for now. Okay, awesome. Good questions, everyone. Thank you so much for your participation. So at this point, we are gonna go over the forms and I'm gonna actually start with the TLC enrollment form. If you are thinking about start, staying on WJCC coverage in retirement, you would complete the TLC enrollment form um, or online if we're doing it online by then, um, and you would choose that you're a retiree. You would do it during open enrollment. Uh, open enrollment is going to be in August. Let me say that again, open enrollment will be in August. So if you're gonna stay on our coverage, you, need to, you would need to do either do the paper form or online, depending on which place we'll be at at that time, okay? So let me go over the form. So uh, at the beginning, part one, you see on the, the blue arrow there, you would complete part one, just like you normally would. Um, name, date, social security number, sign it. The date there, I always get so tickled. Where it says date next to signature, a lot of people will put their date of birth. It's not asking you your date of birth, it's asking you the date that you signed the form at that place, okay? And then in part two, as a retiree, uh, you're gonna ch check box B there that says that your initial enrollment as early retiree, and you're gonna write in the last day of your coverage as an active employee, which would be if, you, if, it's, um, if, you're, if you're less than 65 and you're staying on our coverage, that would be September 30th. If you're going into now retiree status as of October 1. Under part three, Still have to fill in your uh, name and address information. And then in part four, there are a couple of options here. So you're gonna select what you, what you want. Remember, you can go down in coverage, but you can't go up. So if you have 250, you wanna drop to the 500 or the high deductible plan, you can do that. If you have the high deductible plan, you cannot go up to 250 or 500. If you have 500, you cannot go up to, to 250, okay? So you can drop down and then you're gonna list whoever you want to be covered in retirement that's already on your coverage. So if it's you and your spouse and you want to keep you and your spouse covered in retirement, you would list both of you all there. If it's just you and your spouse is gonna get his or her own coverage once the coverage ends and some September 30th, then you would just list yourself there, okay? And then you don't do anything for part C or part five down there at the bottom and you don't have to do any of that. Sometimes people want to fill out the part C part because it asks about Medicare. No, don't do anything there. We don't offer um, the Medicare Advantage options, okay? Also, and you notice I have two red boxes there. You wanna check on the form that this is for retiree coverage. That matters to me because then I have to know whether this is a direct bill or a group bill. It's a direct bill. You are billed directly by Anthem um, to pay your monthly benefit, your, the cost of your monthly uh, health insurance, and you are paying the total premium. I emailed or included with the email that I sent out the current rates for retirees um, based on and retiree only, retiree plus one, or family coverage. And you should have that so you can see what those coverages look like. So family for a retiree would be retiree plus a spouse plus a child or retiree plus two children if they're less than 26 years old. And they were already on your coverage when you retired, okay? The actual application. So the application for service retirement, it is the VRS-5. And I'm gonna go over the entire thing line by line. Starting at the top, you're gonna to fill in your social security number, your retirement date. And if you notice 01, the day is already, day already there because retirement is always as of the first day of the month. And then number three, you're gonna check this is an original application, unless for some reason you're doing a revised application. I haven't had any first time retirees have a revised application. So it's original application. Part A, your member information. I suspect four through 11, you pretty much have down pat and I don't have to go over anything there. So your name, address, 
um, your citizenship status, your marital status, your birth, date of birth, and email address. Please put a personal email address. Do not list your WJCC email address because that's going to be cut off upon retirement. You want access to it. You want to make sure you list a personal address there. The last four questions at the bottom. Number 12, do you intend to make a lump sum purchase of service credit prior to retirement? Um, unless you have some service credit out there that you did not get credit for, for example, maybe you worked part-time early on in your career and you didn't get credit for that VRS because you weren't contracted to work at least 30 hours and you now want to purchase that service prior to retirement, then you would check yes and you need to, that process has to be taken care of prior to your um, retirement date. And I can talk in more detail with you about that. Or if you um, maybe worked in a VRS cover position, maybe you worked in Newport News or York or Loudoun County, and you took a refund, you moved to another state and you came back and you're back into the VRS system, you wanna buy back that refunded time, then that's yes. And again, that refunded time would have to take place, uh, that refunded um, purchase would have to take pl place prior to your retirement date. Otherwise, the answer to that question is no. So again, do you intend to make a lump sum purchase of service credit? Service credit meaning months of service that you wanna add to what's already in the system. The answer to that is likely no, unless you have one of the two scenarios I explained a few minutes ago. Number 13, will you be purchasing service credit with a sick leave payout? So let's go back to talking about sick leave for a moment. Remember, you can get up to $5,000. It is your 25% of your daily rate times the number of days you have up to $5,000. You could use that sick leave payout to purchase additional months of service. I will tell you that um, the most I've seen anybody be able to to purchase is three months and you would have to determine if $5,000, if that $5,000 minus taxes can be recouped in a reasonable amount of time. And you would have to do that. I can't tell you that that's gonna be reasonable for you or, or not reasonable for you. That's a decision you would have to make. So if it's only gonna add 20 or $30 to your check each month um, or maybe 10 in, in the cases that I've seen, and it's how long is it gonna take you to recover that money? So you would have to make that decision if you wanna use that. Um, I had one instance where a person had one month of service they needed to purchase to, in order to make 30, and it ended up costing them around well over $5,000. And they decided not to, to go with that. So um, it just depends. It depends on how close you are to 30 years and it's a lot of things factored in there. But if you decide to, to Use your sick leave payout to purchase months of service. You can do that. That all has to, we have to know that ahead of time. It's something Lacey Johnson takes care of on her end um, and making sure that the money gets to VRS. Keep in mind the $5,000 that we're talking about, the maximum um, is that you're likely not to get exactly $5,000 because it is tax money, okay? Um, number 14, it says, is VSDP participants only? That's Virginia State Disability Program participants. That's state employees, not school employees. So the answer to that is no. Number 15 is a lengthy statement. And basically it says, will you be terminating full-time or part-time um, employment uh, upon your retirement date? The answer to that is yes. If you're going to be retiring, then yes. If you're not retiring, then there's no reason for us to be filling out this form. Okay. All righty. The second page of the form, going on to part B. Part B, the payout options. I re reviewed the payout options with you earlier. And so in number 17, you would select that. You see you have the basic benefit payout option, the basic benefit with PLOP, if you are eligible for PLOP, the advanced pension option. And then with the advanced pension option, remember you have to tell them at what age you want them to make that adjustment to adjust down from your VRS amount. On the right side, pardon me, you have the survivor option, percent payable to, to the survivor. Remember I said that, um, for the survivor option is between 10 and 100% and only a spouse can do 100%. Or you can do the survivor option with a percent going to survivor and the plop. Pardon me, keep in mind that any of these options outside of the basic benefit option is likely to reduce your monthly benefit, your monthly retirement benefit. And block number 18, this is where I am, and block number 18, um, if you selected the PLOP option, uh, either the basic benefit 
with PLOP or the survivor option with PLOP, then you go to number 18. If you chose the basic benefit option or the survivor option or the advanced pension option and you did not choose anything to do with PLOP, then you skip number 18, okay? But if you did choose PLOP, then you would tell them whether you want 12, 24, 36 months, one, two, or three years, if you have worked beyond your unreduced eligibility, 12, 24, or 36 months. And then if you have and you make your selection, you tell them if you um, plan to roll it over or not. Basically, are you going to roll it over into a qualified plan or do you want the check to come directly to you? That's a yes or no question. Yes, I'm going to roll it over to an IRA plan or no, I'm not. In that case, they know it's going to come directly to you. Part C, the survivor information. You will only complete part C if you chose um, the survivor option payout in box 17. So if you didn't, if you chose anything in box 17 other than survivor, then you skip part C. Let me say that again. If you chose anything in box 17 other than survivor, and you skip part C. So if you chose survivor in box 17, you fill out part C. Survivor is different than beneficiary and it says it right there on the form somewhere in the instructions. Your survivor option is the person who's gonna receive a monthly benefit for the rest of their lives after you pass away. A beneficiary is someone that you have listed on your beneficiary form that you want to receive a lump sum of money upon your passing either from your retirement account if there's anything there or your life insurance or and or your life insurance, okay? So again, only part C if you choose the survivor option and parts in number 17. Part D is the certification. Please read that and then sign and date um, the member and then write under that your spouse's signature. You need to probably need to sign. In fact, you do need to sign and date the same day. That would be, that keeps it safe. Part E, the plot. If you chose plot, payout option and number 17, if you chose the plot, then you're going to fill out this page. Otherwise, you're going to skip this page. So if you chose basic benefit payout option, if you chose APO or just survivor, you skip this page. But if you chose survivor with PLOP or basic benefit with PLOP, then you're going to fill out this page. Notice I have the taxable side circled in red because the funds that went into your, your um, retirement account were pre-tax funds. So those funds that you're gonna take out are taxable. Um, and then right under the word taxable, you see a line blank percent directly to me, blank percent paid to the institution accepting taxable rollover funds for a total of 100%. So you don't have to have the full amount come to you if you decide to take the plot or if you're eligible and decide to take the plot. You could have a percent come to you and then a percent be rolled over. If you are rolling it over, then you need to fill out the information under that, the name of the custodian, if it's um, Edward Jones or if it's MetLife or whomever it might be in the address, the account number it's going to, and that re the rest of that information that's listed there. If 100% of the check is coming to you, then you don't have to fill out anything else there. Just that a check is coming to me and I want it mailed to my house or mailed to my um, direct deposit into my account then that's, that's what will take place, okay? The last page of the application for service retirement uh, is where do you want your money to go? So it's gonna go into your financial institution, you list that, and whether it's going into a checking or savings account, and then you tape a voided check in the box provided. Do not staple it, don't glue it, <laughs> tape it down, okay? Um, and if it's a check, make sure it's voided. If it's a savings account, you want to get a savings deposit slip with those little micker numbers at the bottom that list your uh, routing number and your account number. Okay. And part G is the tax withholding. Someone was asking earlier about tax withholding. This is where you tell BRS your tax withholding information. Boxes 30 and 31. 30 is federal, state, uh, 31 is state. Notice in each box, the first one says, do not withhold federal or do not withhold state. If you do not want them to withhold taxes and you're gonna pay them yourself at tax time, then you don't want them to withhold, you check those boxes. If you're not gonna be living in the state of Virginia, you do not want them to withhold Virginia state taxes. And in which case you would check that box. 
Otherwise, you're going to go to the second box in each there and it says calculate my federal, calculate my state, and you're going to tell them the number of exemptions. Okay, whether it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 12, whatever your number of exemptions. I cannot advise you on that. I cannot uh, tell you what your exemption should be. I can try to talk you through it, but I cannot advise you and I would not recommend you ask me um, because I, my advice may not be good. So talk to a financial advisor. Um, it, it, this is another good reason to talk to a financial advisor. Okay. The remainder of the form, if you actually have the form, are um, instructions and information to help you to complete the form. John, before I go on to the next form, do we have any questions? We do have a few. Um, for an HSA, can you use the benefits through September? Health savings account. So if you have a high deductible plan, you have the health savings account. Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Um, will retirees be notified about open enrollment since they'll no longer be receiving WJCC emails? Um, so normally when, what we do um, every year is when the contracts come out, we include in the contract envelope information about open enrollment. So our retirees won't be getting contracts. So what I normally do is set aside some diff another set of envelopes that also go to the schools that specifically address to retirees who have expressed interest and staying on our, and, and, and who are eligible to stay on our coverage for the next plan year in retirement. So you will you will get retirement, you will get open enrollment information. The answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, is the health insurance rate cheaper when we keep it via WJCC? That's subjective um, because it depends on what you're looking for. Um, keep in mind WJCC uh, health insurance includes medical, dental, vision, and prescription all under one cost. Mm -hmm. You may be able to find it for less somewhere else or find them individually for less, but I would encourage you to do your due diligence and check that out before you make your decision to stay on our coverage or not. Okay. On the VRS-5, if we were already in VRS before coming to WJCC and did not take a payout, what do we check for number 12, box 12? Um, as long as you didn't take a refund, you can check no. Okay, and that's it for now. Okay, awesome. Great questions. I just love having you all on here live like this. Okay, moving on to the request for insurance credit form. This is the form that tends to give most people the most consternation. So I'm going, I've actually filled it in and tried to keep it a little bit fun. So starting at the top, the social security number, your, your social security number, your phone number, and then you're gonna check that you are a new participant. You are a new participant. Um, as a new retiree, you are a new participant. Now you, you potentially could have to fill this form out a second time or even a third time if and when you change coverage. So let's say you're on WJCC coverage and you're 65 now and you're gonna be going on Medicare, then you would update this form with with VRS and you would check the second box and says change in health insurance premium or policy, okay? Going down to part A, so you're gonna fill in your name. I have Betty Rubble here. Betty Rubble is, is going to apply for her um, health insurance credit. She's been with VRS for at least 15 years. She lives at 123 Flintstone Way in Bedrock, Virginia. Um, and number six, so number six for all of our employees is not applicable. So you can just put an NA there. That's not, that's not, does not pertain to you. Number seven, are you covered by Medicare Part B? For Betty, she's uh, 65 or older. So I put yes for her. I put in her effective date. She's uh, gonna be effective 7-1-2021. And I checked the amount that she is gonna be paying for her Medicare Part B. Um, so if you are not 65 and you're not eligible for Medicare Part B, then obviously your answer is no. And you just keep going. You, you don't fill in any of those other blanks there and under number seven. Part B, you're going to read the information that says that you understand one, two, and three, and then you're going to sign and date. Okay. Now, for those of you who checked no and number seven, 
And even if you check yes, we're gonna go on to the next page because you, this is where you're gonna put your information about your health insurance, part C. So Betty, uh, let's pretend that she actually said no. Let's say she, no, she's not eligible. Then here's her health insurance information. Um, number, number nine, the provider and plan name. The provider is Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield or it's Cigna or it's uh, TRICARE or it's MetLife or it's Optima, that's the provider. What is your plan name? Well, in our case, it's either Key Advantage 250, Key Advantage 500, or the high deductible plan. So the name of your provider and your plan name. If it's Cigna, it may be Cigna Open Access. That's the name of the plan, okay? Just want you to know that you have to fill in both of those information, uh, both of that, those information there. Number 10, the policy holder. If it's you, you check self. If you're on your spouse's coverage or you will be in retirement, then you check your spouse. Number 11, coverage option, how, who's being covered? Again, she's covering herself and uh, Barney, probably two of them. So she checked two, but if it's just you, then it's single. And if it's you and it's two other people, more than two people, then it's family. Number 12, the policy type. So for Betty, it's health insurance. Now, when I was doing this online, um, the fillable form will only allow you to select one option in number 12, okay? It, and un, but remember the WJCC coverage, we have health, dental, vision, and prescription. So you have to print the form and then manually check those other three boxes because filling it online, it only allows you to check one box. So if you're staying on WJCC coverage or you're under another umbrella of coverage that has everything covered, or maybe it's health and dental or health and vision, then you will have to check one. And then when you print, check the others. Number 13, the premium information. Number 13A, how many times per year is this premium paid? For WJCC employees and once you're retired, we, you will be paying once a month. So it's 12 pays. If you're on a spouse's coverage and they pay into their health insurance at work two times a month because they get paid bi-weekly, then it's two, so it's 24. So how many times per year is this paid? You would need to calculate that. How much is the premium payment? How much is the total payment? Well, Betty's still working for us, so she's only paying the employee rate, so it's $388. You would fill that in. How much is it for the, uh, the portion for the retiree? If it's just two of you all, I always recommend to my uh, employees to just divide that by two for, for 13C. And then for 13D, the effective date of this premium, when did this premium become effective? If you are a WJCC employee, it's always going to be as of the, um, October 1 of the previous year that it became effective. Um, again, one-on-one, -on -one, I can talk you through it over the phone if you need to. That's a for some people, they just look at that and go, I don't know what the heck she just said, but it's really not that difficult. And the information is also at the end in the instructions. So how many times per year is the insurance premium? Did you pay the insurance premium? Or will you pay the insurance premium? How much of the total premium that you're paying? How much um, of it is for the retiree? And then when did you start paying this particular rate? That's what, that's what those questions are asking you. Number 14, if you are on the WJCC plan, all you have to write in is Richmond, Virginia. So if the coverage that, that you're on is not COVA, you do need to provide the address. And our plan, although we work with the DHR, DHRM through the state, it is not a COVA plan. You need to write in Richmond, Virginia. If it's Cigna or if it's Optima, you need to put in whatever the address of the um, provider is. Does this policy cancel a previous policy? Um, if you um, are WJCC coverage, no, basically what's going to change is you're going to go from one policy to next, probably likely the same policy. So you're not canceling a policy, you're paying a different premium as a retiree. And keep in mind, I have on, on this information, I have Betty, Betty's information as though she was still working. This, it, it would really be way more than $388 a month as a retiree. It's in the thousands if it's, yeah, 1400 for her if she were actually doing this as a retiree. Additional policy. So let's say you are on your uh, employee or your husband's or your, your wife's coverage and they only have health, but they have a separate policy for dental and you're on that policy too. 
then you would go ahead and put that information there. Um, same base as asking the same basic information as in part C above. Okay. Questions, John, do we have any questions? It's a lot of information. John, are you there? I'm there. Okay. <laughs> If I am eligible for Medicare in May of 2021, should I use my birth date? Not sure what, what, what section. Um, should you use your, I need to, whoever asked that question, if you can unmute yourself, should you use your birth date for what? Um, it's Bonnie, the, the date of um, eligibility. Um, you had put 7-1 um, as the ending of, of the health insurance, the retirement, no, the, um, are you covered by Medicare Part B effective date? Medicare Part B, you had written 0701. Um, and I was wondering if I should use my birth date instead. So if you are eligible for her question, that's a good question. So Bonnie, it's say um, you are eligible for Medicare you, if you turn 65 in, in April. I'm just gonna use that as an example. And your Medicare Part B was effective April 1, then yes, you would put April 1 there. Okay, thank you. And then you would still stay on our coverage till the end of June, and then your Medicare is already in place, Part B, so you would just keep rolling on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is Part C where you would enter Medigap information? Yes, you can enter Medigap information there. You can also enter um, supplemental information there. Which is the next question. Does Part C include Medicare supplement and Part D payments? Part C, there's no Part D, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, could you ask that again? Does Part C include Medicare supplement? And I, I believe Part D is probably the drug supplement that you can get. Oh, okay. So if part, if under Part C, if that's good, if you wanna put your supplement information there, maybe you have a supplement through AARP, which is United Healthcare, you would put that in, in the numbers eight through 16. And then if you have um, the drug plan that you're paying for separately, then you would put that under additional policy starting with number 16. Okay. Is Part C referring to the insurance you will have when you retire or the insurance you currently have as an employee? The insurance you will have when you retire. Okay. And if, let, me, let me clarify that a little bit further. If you are a July 1 retiree and you, um, are less than 65 years old, and you go, you're going to stay on WJCC coverage through September 30th, you're going to fill this form out twice. You're going to do it with your current information that you're paying as, a, as still an active member of our plan through September 30th. And then about mid-September, you want to send in a second form because either you're staying on our coverage and you're paying a whole lot more or you moved over to a spouse's coverage or a different coverage and you were notifying VRS of that. Okay. Can the health insurance credit be used to pay, <clears throat> excuse me, used to pay my part of my husband's policy? I am on his and no longer on the plan through WJCC. So um, the health insurance credit, remember, is going to be included in your monthly benefit. It doesn't come as a separate check. If you're talking about the VRS health insurance credit, it's going to be included in your VRS monthly benefit. It's not a separate check. Then you would have, you and your husband would have to decide if you want to give him that money out of your monthly check. The health insurance uh, money that would come from WJCC, the 6250, if you're eligible for that, that's a check that's going to come made payable to you, the former employee. And again, you decide whether or not you want to turn that over to your spouse. When I apply for Medicare Part B, there's a form you have to fill out to show that I have had credible, creditable health insurance. Will you fill this out? Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I fill that out. And then I have to return that to you to, to turn into um, Social Security. I cannot forward it on your behalf. They will not accept it from me, but I will fill it out for you. Yes. And I think that's it. Okay. That brings us to the end of the presentation. If, as you can see, there's some information there to be helpful to you all. The, the
the uh, website for VRS, the phone number, direct phone number to customer care at VRS, um, the email address for VRS and their hours. They are still working remotely. Um, and so when you call them, they'll answer, just know that they're not in the office. And there's my contact information, um, which you, most of you already have. However, I do want to, for those who want to stay on, I do want to go to the um, website, to the VA Retire website and kind of peruse that a little bit, just to kind of show you what's there. I'm gonna move this down a little bit. Okay. So this is the VA Retire website. Um, as you can see, if, if you've been there before and you, but you haven't been in the last couple months, it's changed a little bit. The My VRS that I talked about, which that you could, uh, the portal that you can go into to access your VRS plan and how much you have in your, men, your member benefit account um, to do uh, create different estimates on what your monthly benefit would look like, the gross amount. Then that's, this is, it's right here on the right side. I'm circling it with my mouse there, that's my VRS. But before we go there, a few things I wanna show you. So if you go here to forms right here, click on forms. I go to all forms, but as you can see, they have a list of things you can go to. One of them is ready to retire. If you wanna go there, I gotta click the right thing. And so the forms are listed here. If you scroll up, the VRS-5, which is your application for service retirement that we just went over. The VRS-45, which is the health insurance you can download that we just went over. And if you remember in the presentation, I said that you could change your tax withholdings. Here's the VRS-15 to do that. So you don't have to complete a whole brand new retirement um, uh, application form to do that. They have a form set aside just to change your tax withholdings and you can change them anytime and as often as you like. Um, direct deposit, let's say that you uh, change banks um, and you, you need to, so you need to change where your money is going each month. Then here's a direct deposit form. You will fill that out and send that into VRS. They do ask that you wait until one deposit has been made into the new account before you close out the old account. Okay. And then just some other forms that you may want to peruse um, as you go through the site. Uh, retirement plans right here in the middle. I'm going to go there. Um, I invited you and I invite you to go to your plan and look at it. So if I don't know what plan I'm in, Lorianne. Remember, you're going to find that out when you go to VRS if you're not sure. Most of you are likely plan one, but you could potentially be plan two. And if you're relatively new in VRS, you might be hybrid. So you wanna go and look at your plan. I'm gonna click on the plan one and there's the handbook is right there online for you to look at. The other handbooks here refer to other um, employers and employment. So there's the Virginia State Police, you're not that. Let me get this off of my screen. Um, and so on and so forth. The plan book that you want to look at as a, an, uh, school employee is the one that says teachers, and that's whether you're a teacher, an office staff, uh, custodial staff, bus driver. If you're in VRS and you're plan one, you want to go to the one that says teacher. Or if you're plan two, you want to go to the one that says teacher. Okay. I want you to see that. Now, the My VRS, if you have not registered on My VRS, you want to click on that logo. And it's going to take you there. It's going to take a few minutes. So I'm just going to go there. This is the screen it takes you to. If you have registered and you have a username and password, you just plug it in there and you go ahead and log in. If you have not registered in years, I can tell you that they've updated, you may need to re-register. Um, but reg you click on the register now, you're a new user. They also have updated information for retirees and put it there in red, but you're gonna click on the register now. It tells you that you need to have be prepared to provide the last four digits of your social, the la your last name and your date of birth. Then you want to read through the user agreement information and agree. You're gonna put in that information, your last name, your date of birth and the last four of your social and you're gonna click next. This is as far as I can go without actually looking up somebody. So you wanna go, go next. You're gonna be asked four, five, maybe six authentication questions. That's information that's that's been uh, gleaned from census information to make sure that you're you. 
that somebody else is not trying to hack into your information. And then you will, uh, if, if you pass that, and I have known people not to pass, um, they don't remember when I worked, lived at so-and-so 45 years ago or 35 years ago or 20 years ago, I don't remember such and such. I think you get so many times to try before it locks you out, in which case you would have to call VRS directly for them to reset it. But once you've done that, then you, you set your username and password, and then you can go back to that login screen and log into my VRS and see all the great information that's there for you. So again, I want to encourage you to go to the VRS website, peruse around these benefits and programs and you know, all lots of information, long-term care information, so much information out there for you if you have time and you take the time just to kind of look at it. They even offer education. So they have um, videos just like the one you just set through with me that you could uh, register for and participate in. It's gonna be very generic information similar to what mine was. But again, if you need to do that, you, you, can, you can look at their videos there, register and, and participate that way. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and just want to say thank you to everyone who, who participated. There's a lot of information that was given to you today. Before we close out, I just want to check and make sure are there any more questions? John, do you have any additional questions? Uh, nope, just uh, some thank yous to you for your presentation. Awesome. So glad you all were able to be here and oh, sharing yeah. this. Yes. I'm sorry, I do have a quick question. Will we have access to the PowerPoint and recording from today's session? The recording will be, I'm going to um, forward it after in the session to the PR department and they awesome. are will upload it. I apologize, my phone is ringing in the background. I should have oh, put it on do not you're disturb. Fine. You're fine. Um, but I'm gonna forward the presentation to the PR department and they're gonna upload it to the website um, at the end. So we'll be made available for anybody who couldn't join us today. And if you do want the PowerPoint, just email me and I will send it to you. Awesome, thank you so much. You're welcome. And a Gloria, great presentation. Thank yes. You. Do you mind reviewing the difference between a survivor and a beneficiary? Yes, so the, for the survivor, the survivor is a person who is going to receive a monthly benefit um, once you pass away. And that monthly benefit is based on the percentage that you chose between 10 and 100%. And they're gonna calculate it based on your age, the difference between your age and their age. So that, um, and that can be, that's an estimate that you can do in my VRS to say if I want to give my son 50% of my benefit um, when I retire, what might that split look like? So you can do that in your in my VRS um, if you once you register. Uh, so that's a survivor. Your beneficiaries are persons that you that you persons that you've listed on the beneficiary to receive a benefit after you pass away. It's not a monthly benefit. It's a lump sum. It's a life insurance, or if there's anything remaining in your um, retirement account, they will receive that as a lump sum, but not as a lifetime monthly benefit. Does that help? Yes. Great. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, and again, if you have any questions you think of, you can send me an email. You'll get a quicker response to me usually from an email, but I will respond as soon as possible. If you want a copy of the presentation, send me an email. I'll forward that to you as well. Thanks again. And you guys have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Laurieann. You're welcome. Thank I, you. I, had, I had one little issue. So I was at the very end, I was on my by VRS on my account and it went directly to my payout, like what it will be my, my estimate. Okay, before you go into that, um, Julie, yeah. let me end the recording, okay? Yes, ma'am.